So I want to just do a quick thanks to uh, Mobile World Capital for putting this all together. It's a great group here today. Uh, we've got most of the top accelerators, one of the brand new ones. So we're going to take about uh, 40 minutes or so to, to talk a little bit. So Christopher did an introduction for us, uh, but we'll start in just a second. Show of hands in the room, how many entrepreneurs do we have out there? And how many of you are first time? Just to get a handle on what level of sophistication we have in the audience. Well, so we've got five people here. We're going to talk about, we're going to start out with an introduction of yourself, which accelerator that you are representing, your model, and who you're trying to attract. So take a couple of minutes. Uh, we'll start on this side first with John. Um, my name is John Bradford. Uh, I previously ran something called Springboard uh, in London, which is now Techstars London. Um, Techstars started in 2006, uh, and we now run 12 programs um, across the world, 10 in the US, two in London. Uh, we've supported 350 teams to date, raised about half a billion dollars for those teams. Um, what sort of uh, teams do we look to do? We have a vertical. Our vertical is awesome founders. Uh, we don't really care uh, as long as we think you're great uh, and you, you are a team. Uh, we tend not to take single founder businesses. Uh, that goes from... 21-year-olds uh, through to 50-something-year-olds. Uh, in the current batch for London, I have two entrepreneurs who have already been and sold their businesses before, um, and they want to get started in the next one, and this is the natural place to do it for them. Okay, thank you. So, uh, Natalie from Orange Fab. So, Natalie, I am in charge of Orange Startup Ecosystem within Orange. Uh, in charge of boosting open innovation within the group. And so we decided uh, one year ago to launch uh, our accelerator program, uh, Orange Fab. So first we launched it in San Francisco and, uh, and we did very well. And so we decided to deploy it internationally. So we, we deployed it uh, in, uh, in France uh, last week. Yes, last week, in uh, in Tokyo, in Japan, uh, the week ago, uh, in uh, in Poland, because we are also uh, well, uh, I didn't mention, but we are a, a telco operating in 22 countries, mostly in Europe, uh, Middle East, and Africa. Uh, and so in Poland, that's why uh, the accelerator in, uh, in Poland, and uh, soon in Israel. So what we are trying to do through this acceleration program is to, um, it's dedicated to startups which already have a product or service uh, developed, or at least a, a very advanced beta, and uh, we want to help them uh, during this critical phase of go-to-market, so to accelerate their, their go-to-market or they go international because it's an international network of Orange Fab. Uh, and so it's a win-win program be uh, between the startups. Uh, we accelerate their go-to-market and for Orange, uh, we accelerate innovation for our customers. Okay, uh, Reshma? Sure. Um so I'm Reshma Sahoni, co-founder of Seedcamp. We've, uh, we've been around about seven years in, in Europe. We're all about helping European talent go global. So we've backed um, well over 100 companies from founders from across 40 different countries, um, taking that European footprint quite quite broadly, I guess, and our companies have raised, you know, more than $150 million of capital, so about uh, one and a half million on average. Um, we, have, we have founders, again, we're quite horizontal, so it's all about really helping them accelerate um, over the course of particularly the first year, but we really stay with our companies for the life cycle of the company, so the acceleration happens, product market fit, and at the growth stage, and at the scaling stage as well, and we we sort of implement different networks depending on the stage of the business. So we do get companies from anywhere from having some revenue, you know, earlier stage to where they're just um, where they just have a prototype and are still looking to see if there's a there's a product market fit there. So quite quite broadly across um, 
the range were extremely close into the US, so we, we build a lot of the bridges into the US. More than a third of our companies raise funding from, from the US. We've sold, the, we've sold um, a few of our companies to US acquirers as, as well. So we really, you know, again, it's about European talent going global. Gary. Okay, so um, my name is Gary Stewart. I'm the director currently of WIDA Spain, soon to be of WIDA UK. But WIDA really belongs to a larger network of academies. We have about 14 academies worldwide in 12 countries. The idea is to fully leverage and exploit Telefonica's footprint. So basically that means that everywhere that Telefonica has a major presence, there's a WIDA Academy. Uh, we're pr relatively new. We've only been around, I guess, since about 2011. But that being said, our startups have raised about 40 to $50 million already, 13 of which has been in Spain. So we're quite happy about that as well. Um, what do we ask for in terms of startups? Well, we do pretty much active scouting throughout the entire year. The idea is that normally we receive, I guess, between 500 and 1,000 applications, at least in Spain. And then the idea is that we try to get about 10 startups that come into the academies in Barcelona, Madrid, and generally in each of the academies we have around the, around the world. Usually, we don't make the decision as to which startups get in. We ask investors to tell us which of the startups that they think will be most investment worthy within the 10 months of the acceleration process, and those are the ones that get in. So we're pretty quite open as to the types of startups that should be allowed to get in. Generally, it's the investors that help us make that decision. Of course, if the startup has a fit with Telefonica, then that means that we can probably accelerate them even more. Um, so generally, our best success cases have been the ones precisely where Telefonica has then been able to put the startup within um, its its, its product um, catalog, um, or to be able to introduce the startup to its clients. Okay, and Lars. Yeah, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm Lars Book. I'm running the uh, Startup Bootcamp program in Copenhagen, and we focus on, in, on mobile uh, in Copenhagen. Startup Bootcamp is a pan-European uh, accelerator. We have right now eight programs across, and by end of this year, we will have 10 programs. We are a typical bootcamp style uh, accelerator. We are running a program of three months. We, take we give 15,000 euros for 8% of the company and then the whole program. The, uh, the strength of Startup Bootcamp um, is our now more than 1,000 mentors across Europe, which gives us a lot of leverage on the network. Um, and the, then the current numbers is, is really looking good. We are now past 70% funding rate for the teams participating. And we, uh, lately, we, we crossed this magic uh, 2 million euro valuation in, in average. So uh, yeah, that's basically it. OK, so you mentioned a percentage. And we were talking before the panel about uh, the various models and even the definition of an accelerator. Um, so starting back with Lars, if you could uh, reiterate about the, the business model, what is being exchanged, and maybe a little bit about the different models between a private versus a corporate accelerator? Yeah, so what, what is important for, for us in Startup Bootcamp is that we actually have a piece of each company coming through. Uh, we have had 125 startups still alive, is, uh, it has come through the, the program. And being a completely private uh, accelerator, uh, funded partly by investors and partly by, uh, by corporate sponsorships, it means that when we have a small piece of the company, it's not only a three-month program that we are running through, it is, it is kind of a marriage for life, that uh, when we have a small ownership, uh, I, as a franchise holder or as an owner of the Copenhagen program, I personally hold a small stake in each startup, which means that I kind of give a guarantee, my personal guarantee, that I will follow that startup until the end. So, so for me, that's an, a, a very important um, point. Basically, I think we've invested in about more than 300 startups to date. Uh, that basically means that we have invested between about $40,000 usually um, in each of these startups. In exchange, we ask for a 5 to 10% stake, usually closer to 7 to 10%. Um, and they're with us for 10 months. They also get a lot of additional resources in terms of mentoring, et cetera. And I would think that um, what we really want to do is to kind of try and find the superstar startups and then to see if we can kind of help access Telefonica's resources to really take them to the next level. Now that takes the form of a lot of different ways. Like I mentioned before, that might mean allowing them to meet our clients or to kind of include them within the catalog of products and services. That doesn't happen to all of the startups, obviously only to the very best ones. Or it may mean that Telefonica has invested in various funds so we can kind of introduce the startups to these funds as well. Or Telefonica has an internal M&A department as well that can including 
that can even start to look at these startups and to see if they want to work with them from a very early stage to learn more about the market or to just buy them straight out. So the idea is that there are a lot of different options. Telefonica is a huge company with a lot of resources, and the idea is to identify the startups that can transform the business, even though we understand that that's going to be a larger, longer-term process. So you mentioned 7 to 10% equity exchange. So for the benefit of the entrepreneurs, does that mean it's negotiable when I walk in? No, basically it means that from the beginning, uh, it's a convertible note, and the investor that comes afterwards will be the one that kind of more or less sets the valuation. Obviously, we have a cap, but you know that's the idea. We're not going to fight about valuations. We'll determine once you actually have someone who's interested in investing in the company in the first series round. Okay. Reshma. Yeah, so um, our model is quite horizontal. I mean, we, we're writing sort of checks from you know, we'll buy a warrant into a company for 3% when companies have already raised some funding. And um, some, of the, some of our mentors who turn into entrepreneurs, you know, will, will, uh, will come back and be part of seed camp. And so sometimes they'll want us to buy a warrant versus investing right away. So we'll do that. Um, we do 25K for 5%, 50,000 euros for 10%. And then we also write checks for 100 to 200,000. But we only do that with co-investors that are VCs and VCs and angels. So we do that as well. Um, well, I think our, our entire model is based on sort of tier one. And it's about, you know, tier one quality of entrepreneurs that we back and then the tier one access. So, I mean, in terms of kind of who's funded us is the best of the angel community in Europe, um, best VCs, a couple of law firms, corporates as well. And so, you know, it is the, it's the founders of Skype, it's the founders of Zinc, um, it's the head of corporate development um, at Google and, you know, folks like that who have invested in, in Seacamp along with VCs such as Index Ventures, um, Atomic go, Balderton, DN, DN Capital, you know, the backers of Shazam and, and so forth. So I think, you know, these are, these are not just going to be investors sort of that you, you have to pitch to, but they're actually already investors in our 110 companies. So guys like BDMI, um, Horizon Ventures, who was just here on the stage before us, you know, uh, founders of Facebook, um, founders of PayPal are, are all investors in our companies and connected to us. And then in terms of, um, we have partnerships as well with a few corporates. So, you know, Google is a huge partner of ours. Um, so rather than a kind of a three-month space, uh, three-month office space, you actually get a building to access in, in the heart of London. So through our partnership with Google. And, um, and then we do a lot of things with Facebook. Facebook's acquired uh, a Seacam participant recently. Google's acquired a Seacam company recently and, and so forth. So our, our relationships are all about sort of tier one corporates tier one investors all across Europe and, and the US. Yes. So um, within the Orange Fab, we offer the startups, uh, well, logistic, co-working space, uh, convertible notes, um, uh, $20,000 uh, in, uh, in the US, 15,000 uh, euros in, uh, in France. But I think that the most important is the mentoring. Uh, external mentors and internal mentors uh, we we can uh, we can bring our experience uh, uh, experts, uh, marketing experts, uh, technological experts, uh, design expertise, uh, and uh, on top of that, uh, the link uh, and uh, we we want to build a strong relationship with the right stakeholders uh, within the group to make it happen and to have at the end of the acceleration program. Um, a, a, a partnership with the startup to um, help them to uh, reach our 230 million customers, so to uh, have uh, customers, so have revenues, and I think that's also the way for, to help them to raise funds, because of course during this program we organize demo days uh, versus the VC community. Okay, and John? Straightforward and simple, we invest 120,000 US dollars um, for 6% equity, uh, not negotiable, plus a small convertible note. Um, our programs break into two parts. One is we call city programs, which are broad and will accept anybody into those programs. Um, the, the other one which we have brought online is now we work with corporates around particular specialist areas. Um, so at the minute we're running programs uh, for Sprint around mobile healthcare. We're doing one for RGA and connected devices. We work with Kaplan and EdTech. We work with Barclays. 
uh, for fintech businesses. And we just recently launched a program for Disney uh, in LA um, because we feel that uh, not just bringing uh, the entrepreneurial spirit and entrepreneurs and VCs and investors, but bringing the right corporates, tier one cl uh, customers alongside can actually have a profound impact upon startups in particular verticals. So the accelerator started showing up in Europe right around 2006, 2007, and now there's, uh, at the latest count, somewhere more than 100. Um, what's that all about? I mean, this is a lot. Is it good for the industry? Is it getting really confusing for the entrepreneurs to know where they should go? Um, John, you're always good for a strong opinion. Why don't you start? I, I've, I've never in Europe had anybody complain to me that we've got too many VCs or angels. I can't understand why people sit around and go, we've got too many accelerators. To me, it's a, a massive opportunity for entrepreneurs. Um, I think like all parts of the investment community, certain people will come to the market, they will try and run programs, some will do very well and some won't. It's called natural attrition. Um, some will come and go. Um, uh, I think it's, it's for the benefit of entrepreneurs and the education that you can get during those intense three months periods is something which will be left with people for the rest of their natural life. You don't leave it at the front door after you, you stop your last startup. So I think it's really valuable ultimately for the ecosystem. And I'm not so concerned with the number of accelerators out there as I am with the efficiency of the capital. Is it getting to the right places quickly enough if it's trickling through 100 different accelerators. So I'm just curious. And, and with Orange coming to the game now in 2014, uh, maybe you have something to say. You obviously feel it's still a good opportunity, a place you should be. So what are your thoughts? Well, I think, of course, it's a good opportunity. And it's a good opportunity for entrepreneurs uh, between it, because I, I think we, we really can, uh, you know, uh, combining the agility of startups and uh, the assets of big corporates, I think uh, we can uh, really help uh, startups to scale up. And, uh, well, that's all about it. I mean, I think... Sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, go ahead. I mean, I can offer, I guess, you know, it's always nice to have a little counterpoint. I mean, you know, are, you know, are there too many? I think the thing is, Entrepreneurs have to be careful in terms of you know choosing the right one for you, and uh, and also really understanding kind of clearly what all the terms are. I mean, today I heard there's an accelerator I think in Spain that's um, doing office space, pure just pure office space for 20%. So you know I think that's that's definitely egregious, and so I think you just have to be careful that you really find the one that's the the, the right fit, fit for you. And I think I mean one of the things on corporate accelerators you know, again, a counterpoint, again, it goes both ways, but is sometimes you can have, as a startup, if you are too close to a corporate, you can, you can become too aligned and go down the path of what a corporate wants you to do. So again, as a startup founder, you have to be careful that you're not going down the path of a certain industry, you know, certain um, corporate in an industry, and that if you want to build a very horizontal product and a horizontal solution that you know is going to be a 10 million or 100 million revenue business, that you don't get sort of put into this package of selling into a, a Telefonica or an Orange um, in the early days. So I think that's that would be my counterpoint to you know. So, Gary, that sounds like a shot across Weira's. No, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a counter, right? You have to think about it both ways. So. No, I agree. But, but, I mean, at least in our case, I don't think that that particular argument applies um, because at the end of the day, we only have 5% of the companies. The entrepreneurs are the ones who are still in control of, like, 95% um, of the companies normally. Uh, we don't even require at the beginning that we be uh, members of the board. Usually we, we prefer to be observers until there's actually a real Series A round and then maybe we can kind of negotiate. At that point, there would usually be some sort of a VC on, on board, so then there's kind of a sufficient enough counterweight to us to be able, particularly if they're putting a significant amount of money. So I don't think that that argument fully um, plays out, at least in our particular case. Um, secondly, what I would say is that to the question as to whether or not there are too many accelerators, I mean, I had my own startup in Barcelona. I remember I started it in 2007. There wasn't anyone trying to help me. So, I mean, this idea that all of a sudden there are a lot of people out there trying to help you with your startup and trying to help you um, not make dumb mistakes, 
I don't really understand why that should even really be much of an argument. The third thing I would say is that the majority of accelerators are highly selective. We only take 1% of the companies that even apply. So it's not this idea that like everyone who wants to get into an accelerator um, can come in. And then we've seen some startups that have kind of done different acceleration programs as well. So I would say at the end of the day, all we're doing is giving the entrepreneurs more options. Of course, they should fully research those options. They should talk to other portfolio companies as well. So for example, if there is this danger that um, corporates are going to, you know, let's call it like misalign um, market incentives or market needs. Well, talk to the other portfolio companies and ask them, did Telefonica really try to push you in this direction? Did Orange try to push you in that direction? We've had, we have about 300 um, startups. I think there's sufficient people out there. Some of them, the majority of which probably um, did not get, you know, like, uh, they're not going to get like the, the million dollar rounds from the VCs. So they're going to be willing to tell the truth. Just ask them. So Lars, you had mentioned earlier in our discussion about uh, being careful and companies being un uh, uninvestable, I think was your word. Uh, talk about that a little bit, how you get in that position, how you can avoid it. Just, just first to, to support what have already been said here, I mean, Startup Bootcamp will see between four and 6,000 applications this year from 50 countries, so, and we only choose 100. And, and in, in, the, in the game we are operating, it's very, very difficult to say who is the winners. So I doubt that we would even choose the same, same startups if we were allowed to, to, to choose freely. Uh, so I think that there's, a, there's room for accelerators. Uh, one problem is that we actually, we also see a little bit of confusion. What is an accelerator? I was just coming back from Stockholm and they claim that they have uh, 12 accelerators in the city but most of them are governmented university initiatives and stuff like that. So, so we differentiate a little bit there. Um, but we do see startups that have handed over, uh, I think was already mentioned, uh, 20, 40% uh, equity for office space, uh, which makes them basically uninvestable in a later round. Uh, and that's of course a little bit sad. So for the audience again, uh, as an educational session, what are some of the things to really look out for uh, that you would advise uh, any of the entrepreneurs in the room? Yeah, I, I think, I mean, as a startup, uh, do your homework like with everything else. Invest a little bit of time in actually looking. Uh, in Startup Bootcamp, we have very vertical uh, accelerators, so we have a theme and, and find the right uh, accelerator program for exactly your startup. Look at who is the mentors there. Um, we typically have between 100 and 150 guys to choose from in, in a certain city. Uh, and then look at the statistics. If, um, if an accelerate, accelerator don't want to share the statistics, probably it's because it's not very good. Um, we have made a big decision actually uh, around a, mon a month ago and we publicize all statistics. And, and I think that everybody should do that. Yeah, let's talk about statistics and, and measures of success. So we're, what, seven years into the accelerator experiment in Europe. Uh, we're waiting for the billion dollar exits. We're waiting for the results. 10 years from now, uh, what are we gonna say? Or, or what's happening? What's bubbling up right now? Why don't we start at the far end? Um, we, as an organization, uh, I think, the, the basic statistics are 10% of our businesses fail, 90% of our businesses still exist today. 10% uh, have already exited. Um, as I was describing backstage, I think sometimes the frustrations are we see things that other people don't and can't because it's not for public domain information, which is um, we actually get early acquisitions and because we're deploying small amount of capital, um, we actually can repay funds typically within a bin two years. Um, it actually is not that difficult. And that's because they exit really quickly. They might be exiting on a 15 to $20 million uh, exit, but guess what? They've only done one seed round and the entrepreneurs walk away with 70% of that business. That's pretty good work for three or four years worth of effort. Um, I think coming back to Lars's point, I think there's a bit of these things become self-perpetuating, which is good programs are keen to publish the results. The ones which don't publish the results, I would ask why. I would also, if I was looking at this from the other side, is always take references 
on programs, go and ask people who have been through them whether they're successful or not. Actually, go and ask the ones which aren't successful. I regularly point them at our entrepreneurs and say, pick anybody and I will make an introduction. Um, and so therefore, uh, look, th these are relationships that you're gonna have to live with for the next five to seven years. Do you want them in your corner or do you want somebody else? Or actually, are they going to be around for the next five to seven years? Uh, I get paid my salary my primary bonus is based upon making money for my investors and making money for my founders. Um, if I don't, I walk away with a miserable salary. I think um, it, you know some of the things boy, um, kind of bubbling up is, I think if you look at sort of historically in Europe, kind of super successful businesses, you know, billion billion dollar plus businesses were started by people quite experienced and either their second time around, third time around, um, that was generally the case. I think what, what we're really seeing now is first time entrepreneurs and which is the reason why we started six years ago is to really um, have, a, you know, have a support basis for first time founders to build billion dollar businesses. And so, you know, definitely out of seed camp, we're, you know, I'm pretty darn sure we're, we're going to see you know one or more, um, and it'll be first time first time founders, right? So I think that's a big change in Europe. It's not just sort of XVC starting up companies or, or people who sold a couple of companies before, and and then you know the third one or second one they they sort of hit the the billion dollar mark. So I think that's one of the big big changes in kind of the ecosystem where um, where some great new talent is able to build big businesses. And another one is we're also seeing sort of role models at various levels. So, um, you know, to John's point, guys like us um, and our founders, we can be successful at a 20 million exit and up. And so we are seeing, you know, founders who do sell into the 20 to 100 million range um, have a great exit for all the investors because they didn't raise a ton of money and they're quickly starting their next round of businesses as well. So that's that's a second thing we're seeing. And then we're definitely seeing, you know, a lot of these founders just really stay the course. Um, they're able to raise good amount of money from both European investors and US investors, a lot of US investors backing European founders. And so that's allowing them to build, um, you know, 50, hundred million dollar revenue businesses and then really think about going IPO and, and, and much larger acquisitions. So a lot, kind of a lot more at the, you know, across a wider spectrum. Lars, you had something to add? Yeah, I, I think that uh, all of us here are, are working with startups to make money, but I think it's extremely important to also say that it's also because we love to work with entrepreneurship and entrepreneurs in general. I think basically entrepreneurs makes the world a better place to live. And, uh, and I think that we have far too much focus on the next billion dollar uh, exit. Um, we're building, a, there's a new bubble building, annoying uh, in my mind. And honestly, I would rather have 10 teams exiting on 10 million euros than one of my teams exiting on 100 million. Uh, this is about building sustainable businesses that can actually make money and not about a big, big exit. If I wanted to go that direction, I would be a VC. But we have to give the journalists something to write about, right? So, Gary and Natalie, with the, from the corporate standpoint and global, uh, does it change the way you're doing things uh, compared to the more Europe-focused regional? Does what change? Sorry? Does what change the way we do things? Well, I'm asking, is it, does it change your model at all? Uh, okay. Do you have anything to do? You're in London now. Yeah. Uh, does it have any basis on what you're doing in South America? Does it dissipate your focus, anything like that? Well, I mean, I think that um, we do have 14 academies in 12 different countries. So the idea is that at some point you begin to see synergies between the different startups and also between the different geographies. And then it gives you kind of a more global scope as to what's happening. Um, and at the end of the day, how this may be something that could be interesting to Telefonica, which has deep enough pockets to be able to acquire startups or to help them to get additional funding. So I think that that may be the only difference, which is that since this is a corporate accelerator, um, with the idea of trying to help a big corporate that has a kind of traditional business model try to figure out new products and services for the future, we have that specific aim, even though it's not kind of prohibitively 
determinative of what we can invest in those kinds of things. So I would say that we just have a kind of different overview and maybe different objectives in the sense of it's not about even the 100 million euro exit or the 10 million euro exit. There's also a part of it which is about can we actually create something of value that helps Telefonica to create a new business and at the same time then the um, entrepreneur will benefit because the entrepreneur will either get a good exit or some sort of great relationship or partnership with Telefonica. Okay, and with Orange, uh, how many countries are you going to focus on? And uh, we, launched it, we launched it in uh, four countries and soon in five countries. Um, but I think it, it's also about uh, improving uh, the daily life of, uh, of our customers because uh, all these uh, new technologies uh, really uh, improve dramatically uh, the daily life of our customers. So it's also about that. And, uh, and well, that's, um, that's about it. Okay, so we've got about five minutes here. Um, what I'd like to maybe finish on is each of you kind of pitching why an entrepreneur would want to choose your accelerator. Uh, turn the tables a little bit. So Lars, we'll start with you. <laughs> yeah, good point. I think most of it have been said already. Uh, why apply to start a boot camp? Uh, first of all, if you're interested to get kind of one of the one of the tools in the toolbox to create a startup is money. Um, go to the web page and check out our stats there. Um, that's one one thing. But the much stronger thing is the is the community around our accelerator. As mentioned already, we have 1,000 mentors now, and we start to see very very interesting synergies of actually mentors joining the startup teams. One failed team going down, but the guys, uh, the founders moving to other cities, joining other programs. We start to see a very strong kind of community in our alumni. Uh, we have 125 teams now, but uh, end of this year we would have 225. And then it starts to become a fast one. And the last thing is, how do they engage with you? Uh, call me up directly. I'm uh, listed on our webpage. Okay. Gary. So I would say that... Um Telefonica's main benefit is, or why does main benefit is Telefonica. It's a company that has about 40 billion in revenue per year, um, and it's looking to redefine its future with the help and in partnership with startups. I think that that's a really unique opportunity. We're willing to give a lot of resources to help create that future with the startups. That basically means 10 months of um, real estate for free in the center of 14 different cities around, or 12 different cities around the world. It means having access to high level directors of Telefonica that can specifically give you business intelligence and mentorship. It also means accessing um, any of the mentors or investors or business partners that work with Telefonica and of course it also means accessing 300 million uh, clients that Telefonica has. So there are a lot of resources there. If we have the right startup, the idea is that we can make it happen and of course at the end of the day this is all about kind of exits at least for some uh, amount, some group of startups and of course Telefonica is also a potential acquirer of your startup as well. And they engage with you how? Uh, Gary at WIDA.org or just go to our website which is www.WIDA.org. Um, so applications for Seed Camp Berlin are open right now so you can go onto the Seed Camp website and apply um, and applications for London will open after, after we uh, have our Berlin event in, in May. So for us, I mean, I think if you're incredibly ambitious um, as a European talented person and it, you want to go global, Seed Camp is the place for you, and it's it's all about wanting to be, you know, wanting to build a huge business that means revenue, that means profit, that means creating jobs, but really being extremely ambitious. Um, and you want to work with people like us and our investors and our and our partners. Um, so you know, from the Googles to the Barclays and the Telefonicas and 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 so forth to the VCs and angels that that I mentioned who are uh, who are investors in in Seed Camp and and investors in globally world-beating businesses, then we're a great place for, for you if you are incredibly ambitious and incredibly talented. And engaging, how do they oh, So you? I mentioned at the beginning, Seacamp oh. um, Berlin is open right now, so please do apply if you, if you think we're a good fit for you. Okay, Natalie. So for Orange, uh, as I said, uh, we have a customer base of uh, 230 million customers, so in, uh, mostly in Europe, Middle East, and Africa. And uh, we also uh, have uh, big corporate uh, partners of ours, so uh, that's really uh, a way to help startups to reach their market and then uh, to raise money. 
So, and of course, all this, as I said before, uh, to uh, improve the daily life, uh, the digital daily life of our customers. And um, I, I just wanted to, to say, we, we don't want to have uh, uh, startups dependent on ours. This is really, uh, as Gary said, uh, not the, uh, the goal of uh, the Orange Fab program. Uh, well, it's because it's not good either for the startups and either for the corporates. Thank you. John. Um, why Techstars? Uh, we've been described as the number one accelerator on the planet. Um, we currently have five programs open for application, including Austin, Chicago, Boulder, the Disney program, and the Barclays program. Um, and we love working with awesome founders. If we had a few more minutes, I'd like to uh, talk about the, the best one on the planet, but uh, we wanted to keep it friendly here Wasn't and really educational. Somebody else described us as being the number one. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, so we don't have time for questions, but all of you will uh, be around maybe for the next hour or so, so feel free to, uh, to speak with them. I want to thank the panel, and again to uh, uh, Mobile World Capital for having us here, uh, and the audience. Thank you very much. Thank you.